Well, you want to have the uh, short meditation period also, right? Uh, if you wish, Pante. Yeah. So welcome everyone to another uh, uh, session on dependent origination with Bhante Rahula. Uh, so we're, uh, we're very happy to have with us again Bhante Rahula, so one of the senior uh, monks from the Sri Lankan Theravada tradition, uh, giving his second of two talks on Paticca Samuppada, uh, dependent origination. Uh, so, as usual, you're welcome to type in questions at any time, and we'll go through your questions at the end. Uh, so, for now, I'll pass it over to Bhante Rahula, and he can uh, go ahead and lead us in some uh, Dhamma practice and Dhamma discussion. So, please go ahead, Bhante. Uh, well, well, welcome everybody to this uh, this program, and again, I want to thank the uh, Empty Cloud Monastery and Bhante Sudaso and Aya Soma for you know, inviting me to give these talks. You know, this will be the second uh, in this series of two talks uh, tonight that we'll get into shortly. But as we did last week, in order to kind of center our minds and, and get our minds into a listening mode, uh, because usually when you you know hear Dhamma talks, uh, the mind should be in a relaxed and centered uh, frame of listening. So first we'll uh, listen to our body uh, and by cultivating awareness of the body and breathing uh, and then uh, continue with the uh, Dhamma talk afterwards. Okay, so uh, go ahead and try to sit uh, in a comfortable meditation posture. Try to keep the back straight. Try to feel the natural inward curve of the lower spine or try to try to kind of establish that the natural inward curve of the lower lumbar spine kind of just straighten up the back and keep the head balanced on top keep the chin lifted up level to the floor just gently close your eyes just relax the shoulders And now bring your attention down to feel where the buttocks and feet press the floor underneath. First of all, just try to feel where the buttocks press the floor, the right and the left buttock, or your seat. Just feel that sensation of pressure or hardness, the earth element vibration. And just remind yourself of the present moment of sitting, sitting. Can you just feel the way your legs are bent or tucked underneath? Now feel your hands and fingers touching, when you touch the body or touch together. Try to feel the outlines of your thumbs or fingers. Feel the subtle pulse of blood in the hands and fingers. And then feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. And relax the shoulders. Just feel where the clothing touches the skin of the shoulders. Or the chest. Now feel the head balanced on top of the neck. You keep the chin lifted up level, parallel to the floor. Just feel your lips touching together. Just 
You feel the tongue laying in the mouth where the tongue may touch some teeth. Now feel the eyes resting in the socket and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. Just turn on the third eye or the movie camera of the, the mind. Just sort of watch or feel the eyes sitting in the socket. Our fleshy eyes see the outside world, but the third eye of awareness can see the inner body and observe the thought. From that point behind the eyes, you feel other sensations on your face, little prickly sensations, where your glasses may touch the face. And you just remind yourself of sitting, sitting. And from that point behind the eyes, just kind of open up the wide angle lens of awareness to, to feel the outline of the sitting body. It's the general sense of the head on top, the arms and hands at the sides, buttocks and feet underneath. Clothing touching the skin on different places. You can just remember sitting, sitting. See if you can just hold that kind of outline of the sitting body in the mind's eye. And then begin some deep, slow breathing or to take a few seconds to expand your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest, holding the air in the lungs for two or three seconds. To feel the pause and then the contracting sensations of the out breath. Try to feel the last bit of air go out of the lungs. And just take a few more deep, slow breaths like that cultivating this basic mindfulness. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Feeling it, <clears throat> breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. We're going to count the breaths from one to ten. I'll do the counting for you to try to develop a more continuous concentration without the mind running to the past or future. So on the next incoming breath, mentally count to one. Feel the brief pause. 
with the out breath also count to one. Next in breath two. Out breath two. In breath three. Out breath three. In breath four. Out breath four. In breath five. Out breath five. In breath six. Out breath. Six. In breath seven. Out breath seven. In breath eight. Out breath eight. In breath nine. Out breath nine. In breath ten. Out breath ten. We'll discontinue the counting. Just let the breathing come back to its uncontrolled, shorter, irregular rhythm. And continue to feel it. Know when the breath is coming in. And knowing when the breath is going out, you know it by feeling it. When you feel the air moving through the nostrils, and when you feel the expanding and contracting of your abdomen, chest. Try to feel that you're a scientist sitting in the laboratory, looking down through the microscope of concentrated awareness. Just turn up the power of the mental microscope. Try to notice the four phases of each breath cycle. The incoming breath and the brief pause. The outgoing breath and the brief pause. Be aware of how each breath is different, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. It's always changing.
At the same time, be alert for thoughts sneaking up into the mind. Just keep letting go of the thoughts. Just let the thoughts come and go in the back of the awareness. Keeping the breathing process, the breathing body in the front of the awareness. And just keep reminding yourself, just breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting, the ongoing continuous connection to the present moment. This breathing body is the mind's natural connection the present moment awareness. Especially with each out breath, try to feel the body and mind getting more and more relaxed into the present moment. Now mindfully place your hands at the edge of your knees. Take one more deep, slow breath as you breathe in, stretch your head back, pull the hands against the knees, arch the lower back. Hold it a few moments. Breathe in, lift the head up, and on an out breath, press the chin to the top of the chest. Just stretch the neck vertebra. The in breath, lift the chin up level to the floor. Just relax on the out breath. Okay, friends, so uh, I hope you got a little bit uh, relaxed and centered uh, in that short meditation. And uh, so now uh, I'm going to give the part two of this talk on the dependent origination and uh, the, the concept of uh, the rebirth. And last week, uh, just as a short review, we went over the uh, process of 
rebirth as described in the Paticca Samuppada, the 12 links of dependent origination. And we're focusing mainly on the three periods of time, which is normally associated with uh, the lifetime to lifetime uh, process of rebirth. So that uh, life in the past gave rise to this present life and we accumulate karma in this present life. And then when we die, if we're not attained uh, full enlightenment, then the mind will be reborn again uh, in another uh, existence in one of the various realms, depending on uh, the karma. Um, <clears throat> so, the, but what I wanted to talk about uh, this evening is the the moment-to-moment -moment rebirth. So all 12 steps of the Paticca Samuppada, I hope uh, most of you are familiar with that uh, diagram, although we have a diagram, it's a little bit hard to put it up on, on the screen, but uh, the 12 links of dependent origination. So <clears throat> the, you know, that whole process of 12 links uh, is, you know, in the traditional explanation spread over those three uh, time spans, the three lives, the past, the present, and the future. And it shows that the ignorance from, and the karma that we created in the one life, uh, from the, the one life is then uh, kind of brought over into uh, the, this present life, gives rise to the mind and body, and then the we have contact with the world, and then we go through life again, uh, uh, collecting karma. So uh, now uh, we have the diagram here. So I just want you uh, to point out where it says the past causes uh, up on the right hand, top right hand side, the ignorance and the mental formations from the past. When a person dies in those, uh, Mental formations are what propel the consciousness uh, to another existence. And then uh, the consciousness then creates another mind and body for itself. Uh, and then the six senses, contact and feeling. So those are the present effects. Uh, and while we're living, we're creating more causes for the future effects, as you see in the craving, uh, the grasping, where it says attachment, but the grasping and the becoming. And then because of the becoming, that means all those mental formations had uh, accumulated strength. It gives rise to, again, the consciousness will seek out birth in the future life. And then the suffering, aging, death uh, follow uh, that uh, birth. And the whole process is uh, continued over and over again. Now, you know, the Buddha gave uh, many uh, lectures, uh, discourses on uh, Paticca Samuppada. And his, uh, his attendant, Ananda, I think most of you are familiar with uh, Venerable Ananda, the Buddha's attendant for 45 years, who memorized most of his discourses. So he is very familiar with the intellectual aspects of the Buddha's uh, teaching. Uh, although he, he was a Sotapanna, so he had some, you know, some glimpse of the deathless state. So his understanding was uh, more than, you know, just an average person. But still, uh, it was limited because uh, he had only reached uh, that level of a Sotapanna. So uh, one time he was talking to the Buddha and he says, oh, uh, you know, master, the, you know, this Paticca Samuppada is, is uh, you know, clear as a bell to me, you know, and you know, it's, uh, and the Buddha says, no, don't think like that, Ananda, you know, because he knew Ananda didn't understand it in detail. Maybe he understood the external birth and death, but his mind wasn't sharp enough to really understand the, what is called the moment-to-moment -moment birth. 
and death. So, uh, you know, the Buddha said this uh, Paticca Samapada is profound and it, it seems to be uh, deep and it is uh, deep. So uh, he knew that, uh, you know, Venerable Ananda didn't understand it fully. And so uh, this moment to moment rebirth, actually all these 12 links of opinion origination make a complete cycle. It's not spread over the three lives, but in a sense on a microcosmic level, uh, you could say it is. Uh, but that whole, uh, from ignorance all the way up to uh, birth, that whole cycle is like a wheel spinning, you know, revolving in, you know, basically <laughs> a, a nanosecond. And, uh, and so that's why it's very difficult to, uh, to see that. But that's what is most important uh, for understanding the, the suffering. Actually, the Paticca Samapada forms the, the basis of the second and third noble truths, that the arising of suffering is the forward momentum of ignorance, uh, because of ignorance arises uh, the mental formations and all the rest of it. But with the uh, weakening of craving and the overcoming of ignorance by attaining magga and pala, the four stages of enlightenment, then that uh, process is uh, slowed down and gradually comes to a, a standstill. Now, uh, so, but this process is going on moment to moment in our uh, minds. And some people ask, you know, uh, do you have to be, uh, you have to believe in rebirth, and they're probably re referring to the idea of external rebirth. You have to believe that in order to become a Buddhist. And uh, normally I wouldn't say, yes, you have to believe in that to be a Buddhist, but uh, you have to understand the nature of the mind and you have to have, you have to understand the moment to moment rebirth of the mind and the rebirth of the ego and the rebirth of the uh, uh, sankharas and the, uh, the process of becoming, because that is what affects our life, uh, you know, moment to moment in, in this life itself. Uh, and if we don't understand that, then, I mean, the whole practice of Dhamma, the whole Eightfold Path, uh, basically is uh, about, you know, ending suffering in this life, not necessarily future lives. Uh, although if we don't end it in this life, uh, then, you know, there could be future lives or there would be future lives. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, now this moment to moment process, so already, we have ignorance, the mental formations, let's say, okay, we're born in this life, okay? So you were born on a certain date and you're so-and-so. So we already have ignorance, mental formations, consciousness. We have the mind and body. We have the six senses. We have contact with the world and we have feelings arising. And basically that's a given, you know, from the moment you are come out of the womb, let's say, but even while in the womb, some of these things are going on. Uh, there is some limited contact and the feeling and so on, but let's, let's, let's say, uh, just keep it with once we are born and come out of the womb. Then you have the contact with the, the senses start operating and so on. And uh, gradually as the baby grows up, then uh, the memories and so on of, of the past or get reinserted in the, uh, the, the mental formations and the habits of the, the past life also help to influence this life. So anyway, but so we can't do anything so far. Basically, we're the ignorance came with us. Our mental formations came with us. And we have the mind and body and we have feeling. You can't really uh, do anything about those uh, in, at the moment at least the average person, you know, they're going to come. And even craving is going to come also unless one is an, an anagami. 
I will explain that a little bit later. So anyway, so the most important parts of, of this that affect our life now, and especially in the process of meditation, is the craving, grasping, and becoming. So craving, grasping, and becoming, as we can see in the chart, are the, uh, the present causes, but it's also caused, it's also caused the, uh, called <laughs> the karma process. So this is where we create the karma in the craving, grasping, and becoming. And this is probably the most important aspect out of all those 12 links. That's really, especially our, our uh, practice of meditation and the practice of mindfulness meditation and also developing mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. But uh, especially in the, the mindfulness practice, the four foundations of mindfulness and you know the vipassana meditation uh, practices, they're uh, focused on observing and learning how to weaken the force of this karma process, especially the negative karmas that uh, cause us most of our suffering. So the greed, hatred, and delusion are, are thoughts and impulses and urges that are driven by the accumulation of the past mental formations of greed, hatred, and delusion. Now, delusion, the primarily meaning of delusion, of course, is not understanding the Four Noble Truths or ignorance, but it's basically the illusion of the self and clinging to this idea that I am somebody and I exist as a concrete entity, and then clinging to that and the developing you know, vanity and conceit and pride and, and uh, just being caught in this uh, subject-object uh, awareness. So that process is what is continually being reinforced uh, every moment of our lives, basically. Uh, so that's the process that the, you know, the, the only thing that we can really change uh, in our mind, because that's where uh, craving originates, and that's where it also uh, ceases. Uh, there, although it's, you know, it starts at contact, but uh, anyway, so, you know, when you meditate, our six senses are always operating. We're always having contacts. But uh, because our mind is slow and dull, you know, it's a very, we don't really see them clearly only when something strong happens to us, like a bee stings us or, you know, we stub our toe or get some pain or a loud boom uh, happens or, somebody you know shouts our name you know then this contact becomes more uh, kind of uh, obvious you know it jolts our attention but otherwise it's it's uh, mostly fairly subtle we don't really see it we just take it for granted that all these things are coming through our senses but anyway all these contacts are producing feelings the pleasant feelings, the painful feelings, and the neutral feelings. And it's the pleasant and the painful feelings that we react to the most. And basically, it's we have desire and greed for the pleasurable feeling produced by any one of the six senses. And we have uh, aversion for the painful feelings also caused by any of the six senses. So depending on the contact arises these uh, feelings. And these feelings basically are the way we react to, to objects. And actually feelings are the first uh, stirring of the mental process. And so with that contact, these feelings arise, and feelings are basically the vibrations that are moving through our nervous system. And when they reach the brain, they are, or as they are traveling through our nervous system to the brain, uh, the brain senses it as this is some kind of a unpleasant feeling arising. 
or it's a pleasant feeling. So that's that the feelings are what first grab our uh, attention. And so dependent on the feelings arises the cravings. Now, the feelings can be changed. Feelings, normally we might think a feeling is permanent, but no, they're very fluid and they're changing all the time. And we can actually learn to, uh, usually things our whole life, they're either pleasurable or painful to us. And we keep on reinforcing the idea of certain things are pleasurable and we want them. And we keep reinforcing that certain things are painful and we don't uh, like them. We want to get away from them. Uh, because for most people, it's too much difficulty to change. Change, so they just uh, continually becoming addicted to sensual craving and having aversion, getting bugged and irritated uh, and trying to, struggling to get away from uh, unpleasant uh, feelings. So, <clears throat> so anyway, depending on the feeling, the craving arises. Now craving is that initial liking or disliking of a, of a, of a sense object. It's that initial attraction. So it's like being attracted. You hear a pleasant sound and there's a subtle kind of attraction that, you know, kind of you like to hear that sound as opposed to a, a painful sound, like maybe a, a car crash or a, a, some unpleasant words that you hear, you know, then that causes, there's a contraction of the mind that wants to pull away from that. So. That's the initial uh, craving. Uh, and craving is positive craving to get something and negative craving to get away from it. And I've already mentioned some of this uh, last week, but it helps to review it again also. Uh, so from the craving is the initial uh, thought or desire for something. And if you have good mindfulness, you could say, okay, desire is arising, but, you know, just let go of this. It's not appropriate now. And uh, or you, you uh, pay attention to something else, and you may forget about that. So it may not turn into grasping. Now, grasping is the continued focus on the object of the craving and building it up. That means planning, scheming, conniving, uh, maybe even... Uh, you know, telling lies to want to get what you want or, or get away from you what you don't want. But so it's the, the grasping that means the mind is holding that initial object of the desire. And so it's much stronger and it involves a lot more thoughts and uh, impulses to, to uh, develop that, uh, that grasping. And you're thinking while you're doing that, you're also thinking about, uh, you know, you come to a, a moment of deciding what you're going to do about it. Uh, and that is the becoming. So the becoming is the karmic action, is actually the, the karma. The point of becoming is the karma, the, the action, the deliberate action, the the you know, the conscious, the chaitana, the intention to want to tell a lie, to, to kill a, a mosquito, for example, or even to move your posture if you're having pain, or to even think about something. Uh, you know, so any of the karmic actions, uh, once you make a decision and do it, then you've basically committed that uh, karma. And that strengthens the, the habit formations in the mind. So the becoming, another word for becoming is, uh, you know, translated as being. So I think Bhikkhu Bodhi in his books, he, he uh, uses the word being uh, for the becoming. Now these are connected. Uh, now being or bhava uh, means becoming in one of the three realms. So this is a little bit more complex to understand, but it means uh, becoming for more sensual pleasures. Uh, so sense desires, the more you are 
developing desires for the six senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and, and touches, then you are developing this uh, Kama Bhava. Uh, excuse me, this, uh, yeah, this uh, uh, sensory, um, yeah, Kama Bhava, the, the sense realm, becoming in the sense realm. But if you practice meditation, there's called the, uh, the, the being uh, Rupa Bhava, which means, this means the, the, the bliss and the other things that come through deeper meditation, like the jhanas, okay? So if you practice and attain the jhanas and you see various mental, you know, nimittas or you experience a bliss or you experience inner light and you develop a craving for that or a desire for that. And then if you, if you died with the mind in a state of jhana or clinging to any of these mental, uh, subtle mental images, then that is called the rupa bhava or becoming, you could actually be reborn in one of these, what is called the Brahma realms. That's, you know, it's a little bit complicated, but <laughs> you can study it in the Abhidhamma. So, uh, or the uh, becoming in the formless uh, realms. But generally, uh, most people are going to be, you know, reborn in these sense realms because probably not that many people are attaining those very deep states of meditation that would cause them to be born in Brahma realms and so on. But of course it is possible. Uh, but for the average uh, person, so you make a decision and you commit the karma. So the becoming means the habit has become stronger. And also the sense of ego has become stronger. And this is what is probably the most important to understand in our practice of meditation. And the whole practice of Dhamma is about weakening the becoming process. Uh, because that is the results, we reap the results of those karmic actions. So you could have a thought of doing something but if you don't actually do it, then you're not gonna, you know, you could have the thought of telling a lie, but if you stop short of telling a lie, then you, you, you know, you won't probably get caught for actually telling a lie or stealing something or so on. So the, uh, the craving, the grasping and the becoming, uh, and then the becoming gives rise to uh, birth and the becoming and the birth are kind of, you know, connected because whenever there's becoming, there'll be birth. Uh, and that means in the moment to moment process, uh, birth means the arising of the ego again, the sense of I. Because, you know, in the Buddhist psychology, the mental process, the mind is a, is a process of mind moments. So each moment of consciousness, has its own arising and vanishing. And the whole uh, process of the 12 links of dependent origination uh, arises, goes through that cycle with each moment of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking. And uh, in Buddhist psychology, we, it's called a mind moment in the Abhidhamma, uh, Chitta Kalapa. And that means the consciousness arises with the object and then vanishes. And that happens in a, you know, just a, a nanosecond or uh, even faster than a nanosecond. But it, it, it keeps on repeating over and over again because at any moment there are thousands of sensory stimulations coming through our senses. Now we're not aware of all of them because a lot of them are kind of weak and we don't really notice them. Uh, we only notice the, the big ones. But even, even those big ones, even in meditation, any of you, you know, who practice meditation, even though you're feeling the breath in a good state of awareness, you, you know, in the background, there's so many sensations that are coming and going. And each of those is one of these uh, arisings and vanishings of consciousness. But because our mind is slow, we don't see these 
arising and vanishings of the consciousness. So the consciousness appears to be something kind of solid or flowing because our mind is too slow to, to perceive that very quick arising and vanishing. And uh, that's why actually Vipassana meditation is designed at tuning the attention into that process of noticing how quickly things arise and vanish. Uh, and it's basically the consciousness uh, that arises and vanishes uh, along with the objects. But basically it's the consciousness and the sense of ego arises with the consciousness. So the sense of I uh, arises. It, the I isn't some permanent fixture in the mind. It arises with each moment of consciousness and vanishes. And it's doing that again, as I mentioned, uh, in the Abhidhamma, I think it says 10 to the 24th power times. So if you can crunch some numbers and see how many times 10 to the 24th power is, that's how many times consciousness is arising and vanishing. Uh, so, you know, normally we don't see it because our, you know, we don't have that uh, power of, of the, the mind. But it can be uh, developed to see that process uh, to a certain extent very clearly. But anyway, so I'm just saying this because each moment the ego arises with the consciousness and the, the ceases with the consciousness. We don't see the space in between the consciousness. If that conscious process is suspended, then that's when we can experience emptiness or the, the state between birth and death. But each of those mind moments, this whole cycle is, uh, is going on and they're all carried uh, forward. So the birth refers to the sense of I, once you get the object of your desire or you get away of the object of your aversion, the, the, the ego says, I, I won, I got it. You know, I got what I wanted. I, I got that object of my desire. You know, I satisfied my taste, my hearing for pleasurable feeling. Or you, you got away from uh, the painful sensation. Oh, I you know, prevented my in-laws from coming to visit me uh, next week. But you know, I told them a lie. I was going to do something else. And so they decided not to come. So, because of that fear, of, you know, maybe of you know, uh, having uh, that unpleasant feeling. I mean, that's just one gross example. Don't, don't get me wrong about in-laws. Uh, I don't have any, but uh, anyway, so the, that's this idea of the moment-to-moment -moment rebirth is this moment-to-moment. Uh, -moment, uh, the consciousness is reborn in the moment. It's not the same. Because with each moment, that whole cycle going through, we've changed in some way. The contents of our mental formations have changed, pr primarily that. And when we practice Dhamma, our ignorance or wisdom could also change. You know, we can weaken ignorance by, you know, developing insights in, in meditation and, and so on. So anyway, coming back to this process of craving, grasping and becoming. Uh, so the, that's how the becoming and the birth with each karmic uh, action, I mean, again, it's a deliberate intention, the karma. And that's what strengthens a sense of uh, self or I. And it's born again the next moment that the habit will be born again. So it becomes stronger. So you can see the, the translation of becoming means that habits have become stronger. Our sense of I has become stronger because we satisfied it uh, by, you know, even reacting to pain as a kind of a satisfaction of the ego, you know, <laughs> certain sense. But, uh, and therefore those habits will be born again. Like telling a lie will be born again the next time the similar situation arises or killing a mosquito or any of the habits. They're born again too. 
So it's not only the birth of this body, but habits are born again. Ego consciousness is born again. So this is one of the meanings behind birth in the moment to moment uh, cycle. And that's what we need to understand uh, in our, to really understand the Dhamma and in our practice of meditation, we have to observe this process because it's only in weakening the power of that process of craving, grasping and becoming uh, that we can slow down that process of birth. And once you're born, then, then of course the suffering in the old age happens too. In old age, a person might think, how does an old age happen in a moment to moment rebirth? Well, you know, even a nanosecond is old age <laughs> in, uh, you know, the micro, you know, in the scientific uh, uh, analysis. So uh, that, you know, even each thought it arises, but it lasts a few seconds. That means it's getting older and then it vanishes. You let it go or a sound arises, you know, uh, like this sound, it fades away. That's the, that's the aging and death of it. You know, it stops. That, that particular sound died, or oh, that thought died. So anyway, this is the way that uh, we try to see the process of birth and death. Or this particular samuppada going on. Now, I wanted to explain also, which is very important, uh, the connection between. Uh, the craving, grasping, and becoming uh, with our practice of the Dhamma, the practice specifically of the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, I think most of you know the Noble Eightfold Path is divided into the three trainings of Sila, Samadhi, and Panya, or uh, skillful conduct, calming the mind, mental composure, and the uh, <coughs> uh, wisdom, <laughs> excuse me. So the, the the wisdom that means the deep insights. Okay. So uh, all the eight steps of the eightfold path fall under these umbrella groups, and I think you probably know them. I'm not going to probably uh, relate all of them, but uh, so now actually. It's the practice of sila or, you know, observing precepts, whether you observe five precepts, eight precepts, ten precepts, the precepts of a, a monastic and so on, but uh, or any other type of discipline that you are trying to discipline uh, the body and the mind. So this uh, sila directly affects the becoming. So let's say a person, you know, we observe the 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 precepts about uh, killing, stealing, lying, sexual misconduct, intoxicating the mind. Now, whenever an urge to do that comes up, we might have the urge. So the craving arises, but if we have, because of our mindfulness and our understanding, we resist that craving. We don't allow it to continue grasping the idea, oh, yes, I want to have it, although it might go on to that. And then you might make a decision, okay, I'm going to do it, but at the last minute you'll remember, oh, yes, I took the precept not to kill that mosquito. So you, you kind of, you know, you have the urge to, let's say, swat a mosquito and, you know, the arm is lifted up like this. And you're, but then you, you remember the precept and you kind of uh, force yourself to bring the hand back down. So you, at least you stop before you actually would have done that karma of killing or you know, stealing, sexual misconduct, uh, lying, and, and so on. The same process can be applied to any of the other precepts. So you've prevented at least the suffering that may have come to you and the habit. You weaken the habit for one thing, uh, and you've prevented the suffering that might have come. But uh, the sila itself does not necessarily weaken the grasping. So uh, the sila directly affects the becoming process, you know, putting the brakes on your actual karmic actions, depending on what precepts or discipline that you are following. 
but it doesn't necessarily change the, the thoughts in the mind. So this is where the, the samadhi is what directly affects the grasping. Now I mentioned before, the grasping is the continued thinking about the uh, initial object of our desire or aversion. We go on thinking about it and you know, up to that point of deciding what you're going to do about it. Are you going to do it or not do it? Uh, and if you do it, you make the habit stronger. If you don't do it, you make the habit weaker. And in the same idea, if you do it, you increase the sense of I. And if you don't do it, you kind of weaken the sense of the, the I to a certain extent. Uh, so when you, the samadhi, of course, is is you know, concentration or the mental calmness. So, you know, when you meditate, when you're practicing mindfulness or you're practicing uh, concentration or a combination of those, you know, the mind becomes calm. And in that state of meditation, if it's a real deep state of concentration or awareness, the last thing that would come in your mind is the thought to, <laughs> to go out and kill somebody or even to uh, have sex with somebody else, right? Or uh, break any other precept. You know, the mind is, is in perfect contentment in the present moment. Just, you know, experiencing those subtle blissful sensations or just in the state of the present moment. And so not thinking about anything else really. So in that state, that's when the grasping has been uh, subdued uh, through the practice of the samadhi. So that's how the samadhi directly affects the grasping. But there's still craving there. Now, uh, craving is, again, the initial thought or desire of something. And craving isn't really that powerful, you know, because it's just coming from the past habit. Uh, you know, and you have a initial desire to scratch the itch. But with training, you can overcome that. And so in a lot of cases, the craving uh, is not that strong. It's just the initial desire. And it doesn't go anywhere unless you continue to think about it. You grasp the idea. Uh, and so that's why oftentimes I tell people, don't worry so much about cra craving. Pay attention to grasping, or actually you work on becoming first. And then when you subdue the becoming to a certain extent, the mind naturally will become more peaceful because it's less guilt, worry, remorse, and fear. And therefore you'll be able to subdue your thoughts more. So by practicing, by weakening becoming, practicing sila, when you, then you meditate, you don't have so much greed, hatred, and delusion, or guilt, worry, remorse, and fear, the mind can enter deeper states of samadhi. And then those thoughts and urges also will uh, uh, subside. Uh, but again, the cravings can be there as the, as the latent tendencies. So craving, actually, if you're familiar with the four stages of enlightenment, craving that means sense, desire, and ill will are only uh, attenuated with the, the level of a once returner. So even a sotapanna can have a lot of greed and aversion, but they wouldn't commit this certain karmas that would cause them to reach some uh, uh, woeful states of uh, rebirth. But nevertheless, they still have uh, greed and the craving and desire and the aversion. But only with a once returner is it weakened, let's say arbitrarily we'll say 80% or 90% weakened. So only if your buttons were really pushed or in dreams, you might have sensual desire, dreams or aversion and so on, or if your buttons are really pushed in your waking life. Uh, so, it shows you that craving, you know, you can't really do much about uh, craving, but grasping is really the one that we should pay attention uh, with. A lot of people hear the Buddhist teaching, the second noble truth, oh, craving has to be overcome. You know, and they, they think, oh, you have to give up craving. 
a lot of people have said that, you know, why do we have to give up all desires? You know, it's impossible, you know, if, if you explain it that way. So, you know, don't make a big deal out of the craving. Pay attention to the becoming and the grasping. When you pay attention to those, then the craving will become very easy to get rid of. Uh, because really the craving is when we're not satisfied. But when you attain samadhi, you, you, the mind comes to the present moment and is no longer thinking about the past or the future. So naturally, uh, you, the craving gets weakened because uh, craving is based on thoughts of the past and the future. Uh, you're not content with the present moment. Think, oh, uh, tomorrow I want to go here or uh, in five minutes I want to go have an ice cream or whatever. So the mind is always you know, projecting in the future. But in samadhi, uh, then it's not. So uh, <clears throat> that's the way we should try to see this uh, process of craving, grasping, and becoming. But of course, even the craving is arising because of the feeling. So in mindfulness practice, we, that's why the, you know, the second foundation of mindfulness is the attention to feelings. So we can't do anything about contacts, but when we have a feeling, we can resist the urge to react upon it. And as we do that, we can also gradually, feelings can change. What used to cause you a painful feeling could at some point become just a neutral feeling, or in some cases, even a pleasant feeling. Or what might have given you a pleasant feeling in the past could eventually, you know, give you a, a produce a neutral feeling or uh, a painful feeling. Relationships are probably a pretty good example of that, right? You know, if you break up with somebody and you might have before had a pleasant uh, sensation when you saw or heard their voice, but later on, something happened and then you might uh, have a neutral or even a painful feeling. Uh, and so this, you know, our feelings can change, uh, but they change through the development of our wisdom. So anyway, so uh, seeing how this whole process of the internal rebirth, this whole cycle, this 12 links of dependent origination are really going on uh, every moment. But we, you know, most of them are subtle. Like we're, we're not always aware of ignorance and the mental formation of consciousness. These things are a given. And so, uh, but the ones that are really uh, occurring every moment that we're uh, reacting to are the feelings, craving, grasping, becoming. Uh, and then the birth is the result of that and the suffering that it results on it. So that's the way that, we, uh, you know, this internal rebirth, that means the rebirth of the mental process, is important to understand if one uh, uh, wants to really reverse that process of the becoming. So you, depending on, uh, with the elimination of ignorance, then the, the, the consciousness and the and the relinking consciousness and all that, or the continued consciousness uh, uh, ceases. So anyway, I just, I wanted to point out uh, that, uh, that the process of the internal uh, rebirth, because especially really that's the focus of Vipassana meditation. Vipassana meditation, one of the meanings of it is seeing reality as it is. And the reality of things as they are is that everything is changing. That means this process, mental process, our sensory process is arising and vanishing every moment. And we're changing in that process, nothing is static. And even the sense of ourself and I is changing every moment as well. Our egos can get bigger and stronger or they could get weaker and weaker depending on uh, you know, the way that we think uh, and our, our wisdom and so many other related uh, factors. So that's why in the perception of impermanence, you know, the, the Buddha has says many times, one who perceives impermanence, the perception of permanence is the way that you uproot the sense of I. That means when you, you see how the ego is, the I consciousness is born and dying moment by moment and gaining strength and how that is the, 
that is what really powers the mental formations and uh, all of the craving and karma we do in life is because of this strong sense of I and me and, and the craving and aversion and the, the suffering that comes with it. So only by clearly seeing that, that is when one is said to really uh, have developed the right view. So we were giving a, there was a program on the right view the other night. And uh, so the right view, one is said to be a developed right view when one has that, uh, that glimpse of that suspension of the, of the, the mental process uh, in that moment of, uh, you know, uh, awakening or in that uh, attainment of the, uh, you know, entering the stream or, you know, that process of gaining insights. So you interrupt that process of craving, grasping and becoming and the ego is paused uh, uh, temporarily and you see the deathless state. So that is, uh, you know, the development of right view and then you have the super mundane uh, right to view. So that is, uh, again, really where the Vipassana process, in Vipassana, actually, you have to speed up the, the per process of perception. That's why just concentrating on a single object, people can get stuck on that. And uh, their minds can get absorbed in the bliss of uh, just like jhanic bliss and so on. And, uh, but not go on to really clearly see the process of impermanence. And uh, so that's why the Vipassana system of meditation where you use the concentration to gain the mental calmness, but then you, you tune in and open up to see how quickly things are arising and vanishing through the six senses, we we'll call it six sense door awareness. And you develop that concentration helps to keep the mind steady on that. And as the concentration develops, you can see that process of arising and vanishing of moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, arising and vanishing very quickly. And you're no longer holding on to any of those uh, mind moments. And if you're able to continue that long enough, that process, the ego gets dissolved because the sense of I arises because of the identification or the attachment or aversion or identification to any of those six sensory uh, stimulations or even our thoughts. But when you're no longer holding on to those or identifying with them, and the mind is just in the present moment, the sense of I starts to dissolve. It's sort of like a, an ice cube dissolving in a bowl of water. If you have a, a bowl of water and an you know, ice cube is floating in there, the, the ice is also water, right? But it appears to be separate from the, the water because it's solidified. So the same way our ego consciousness has been solidified around the sense of I and me because of its tight holding on to attachment and aversion and delusions. It's a, that holding that keeps it together, keeps the... the ice crystals you know, together. Uh, but with the fire of concentration and the heat of insight uh, and letting go, uh, that sense of I begins to dissolve. And then when the, the whole ice cube is melted, then it becomes the water. And uh, it's not like uh, it's, you can't say it cease to exist, your water cease to exist. You can't say it exists e either in the same way. There is no way really to describe it. <coughs> so just to use a kind of a, a, an example, that would be like the experience of the dissolution <coughs> of the sense of I. So I think uh, with that, I think I may uh, end this uh, talk. And now, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, you can remove that <laughs> diagram. Okay. And uh, 
Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bhante. Handamayang uh, dhammakataya sadhu karang dadama se sadhu, sadhu, sadhu anumodami. And at this time, we have a few questions. So I'll go ahead and bring up the questions and um, so you can answer them as you see fit. Uh, so, oops. the first question that we have is from Bobby. So Bobby asks, um, if you can clear up rebirth for me, I'd appreciate it. I've always considered rebirth more of an energy transfer. Is this right view? Uh, you could say yes, uh, right view in the sense of uh, you have to understand what that energy is. So. Uh, if you're if you're thinking uh, rebirth is an energy transfer, yes, the energy is the rebirth consciousness. Is the consciousness that's being affected? That I mean, that's an energy. Uh, it's basically the life force, uh, and uh, you know it's laden with these karmic impressions that we've already mentioned. So yes, you can see it as a transfer of energy. It's being attracted to another place where it can. Uh, continue to work out that energy uh, and that can be applied in the lifetime to lifetime process but even in the moment to moment process because it's that craving and grasping in moment to moment that keeps propelling uh, the the ego consciousness and the accumulation of the karma with within this life itself <clears throat> so okay. you know yeah, it would be part of right view, yeah, if you see it that way. Yes. Thank you, Bhante. And next, Bobby asks, what is the difference between Nibbana and non-existence? It seems to me to be basically the same, yet Buddha warned against craving non-existence. <laughs> well, when the Buddha talked about the, the Vibhava Tanha, that means the craving for non-existence, uh, because the ego is craving non-existence. So because of that, that's still a craving. So for example, and, and uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not uh, making slight of these things, but if a person commits, uh, uh, contemplates, let's say, taking their own life, then they're doing that because they, they have some pain or they're dissatisfied or, you know, so many causes might be there for a person wanting to take their own life. Uh, because even young children, uh, kids take their life. Usually it's because of depression or other psychological disorders. Now I'm not, not making light of that, but their sense of ego is still strong. So therefore, they, they think that ending the life is going to cause that to go away, but it doesn't. Because, you know, just ending the life, you haven't ended the, the, the reasons in your mind that give give rise to that desire not to live anymore. So it's, it's going to continue. That's why taking your own life is not uh, really condoned uh, in Buddhism uh, <clears throat> for that reason. Now, Nibbana is different. Nibbana is when you've already dissolved the ego through the development of wisdom. And so it's not like non-existence. It's not like craving for non-existence. You're not craving for it. You're craving for the end of suffering. Uh, but when you reach the end of suffering, <laughs> the cause of that further existence also uh, ceases. But it's not, uh, so the Nibbana, a lot of people call it an annihilation, but it's not. Uh, and in fact, there's a nice sutta, there's a, there was a general named, I think it was General Siha in one sutta, and he came to the Buddha and he said, you know, people accuse you of being an annihilationist. And he said, well, there's one way that I'm an annihilationist. I, I condone or advocate the annihilation of greed, hatred, and delusion. That's all, he, that's all he advocated was the annihilation. That means the overcoming of greed, hatred, and delusion. <clears throat> uh, and so Nibbana is said to be neither existence nor non-existence. It's one of those terms that you can't really describe, uh, and so on. OK. 
Okay, thank you, Bante. And the next question, Anita asks, would you say it's possible to transcend this moment-to-moment -moment rebirth? What would that state be like? It would be attaining the uh, Niroda Samapati uh, and the, uh, you know, one of the fruitions of uh, Nibbana, the uh, Sotapana Sakarigami Arahant, Arahant uh, non return Arahant, when they attain their respective Samapatis, uh, that means the experience of Nibbana, they temporarily can end that process. But only when an Arahant attains Nibbana, that is the end of birth and death. So actually the Buddha, he died before he died. A person who attains Arahantship dies before they die. That means they've died, the ego has died. Greed, hatred, and delusion has died. And that is the real death in the Dhamma. The death of this body is not considered any big deal. It's like going into a closet and changing clothes and coming out in another suit of clothes only. It's not really death uh, in the Dhamma language, you know, death in the, in the super mundane uh, understanding. So uh, <clears throat> the Arhat is basically already transcended birth and death in that sense. They've already uh, terminated sansara because sansara is the process of the mind going through these 12 links of dependent origination every uh, moment. That's really the process of sansara. When that stops, then the outer process of sansara also stops. So you've got to stop the process of the inner sansara first before you can stop the process of the outer sansara. Great, thank you, Bhante. And the next question, Yogi Beginner asks, is dependent origination only for humans or does it also apply to animals, devas, etc.? Well, you mean the cycle of birth and death. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's every being, whether you're an animal or a deva or even brahmas, they're also still in sansara. And uh, even Brahmas, the, in some of the Brahma realms, which the lifespan is many thousands of years or even eons, and <laughs> when you consider uh, Arupa Janas, but they'll die from that and come back again to be reborn according to the, that uh, theory, uh, you know, uh, about it. So, uh, yeah, it's still, uh, uh, and I forget the <laughs> original question, but yes, it's... Uh, still in sansara. So it's, it applies to everybody. But only a human being or a deva probably could practice the Dhamma in a way to gradually reverse that process. So the human realm is said to be, because we, we, you know, we have access to all the six senses and so on, and animals don't have the, the level of mental formations and in the, and so on that would allow them to really uh, think about the Dhamma, practice Dhamma, you know, most animals probably not, and some devas maybe, but that's another issue. Great, and the next question is from Gita, who asks, uh, to stop the grasping, should one use mindfulness and reflect on impermanence, unsatisfactory nature of life, slash suffering, and no self? Will this help to let go of grasping when one reflects on this? Uh, yes, of course, we use mindfulness and we reflect about how quickly our experiences are changing. And uh, we can see how quickly our mind tries to grasp on to various sensory stimulations. And the practice is, you know, trying to n not let the mind grasp on to especially the negative ones and to create the karma. Now, it can be helped by developing concentration too, as I already mentioned, when you develop deeper concentration, the, the grasping is temporarily suppressed, but the, the craving is still underneath, so the grasping will come again. It's only with the insight and developing the, the anicca, uh, the insight into anicca, dukkha, anatta, and eventually attaining the state of a sotapanna. That is when uh, you have that uh, super mundane wisdom, and that's when it 
uh, you don't still don't have perfect mindfulness yet and you still have grasping but uh, the grasping is only eliminated uh, at the arhat stage, but it's weakened little by little as we go on practicing. And next, Anita asks, can you please share some ideas on the practice of weakening becoming? Practice sila. When you practice sila, you weaken becoming. That means you, you put a break on your actions. You have to keep reminding yourself. You see the urge to tell a lie, kill, steal, cheat, go, uh, you know, some sexual misconduct ideas or whatever, uh, intoxicating the mind or even the other precepts of malicious speech, harsh speech, frivolous speech, the 10 unwholesome actions. Uh, <clears throat> when you have to see the urges, that's why developing mindfulness is about seeing the urge that arises and the intention. Is this an unwholesome intention? You have to reflect, yes. Is what I'm about to do, is it going to be something wholesome or unwholesome? This was the instructions to the, that the Buddha gave his son Rahula in the famous you know, sutta to the, uh, his son Rahula. That whatever uh, you're about to intend to do, you have to consider, is this something wholesome or unwholesome? If it's wholesome, then if it seems right, go ahead and do it. If it's unwholesome, then you have to practice the right effort to uh, overcome that, let go of that or substitute the unwholesome intention for the wholesome intention. So yes, there's constant reflection. We have to reflect on our intentions. We also have to reflect on the consequences of our uh, actions and said, do, do I want to keep repeating this over and over uh, again? And, uh, you know, just being constantly caught in this web of uh, karmic cause and effect. Okay, and the next question is from Gita. She asks, when can one cultivate Nibbida in this process? Is it between grasping and becoming? Nibbida is... Uh, yeah, usually translated as disenchantment. So you become disenchanted. Uh, and in fact, there's a there's a the uh, Dhammapada verse uh, that uh, I often recite. You know about sabe sankara anicchati yada panyaya pasati atanibindati dukke esamago visudya. That means nibindati is the same as nibida. So one becomes disenchanted with suffering when one has the insight. So it's the insight into how craving and grasping and becoming cause suffering that at some point allows you to develop that uh, nibida, that disenchantment. You're no longer enchanted with the, the lure of you know, sensual pleasures or you become disenchanted with being caught up in your negative habits, you know, in, like enough is enough, you know, and, you know, I'm going to go de detox, or I'm going to go whatever, you know, you, you make some major decision to, to change or overcome some of your bad habits. And this next question from Piyal and Indira, it says, birth is defined in the sutta as appearance of the six senses or the five aggregates. Is moment-to-moment -moment rebirth more likely the activation of senses, for example, the six senses to contact, and from there the formation of the aggregates, for example, feelings, perceptions, and thoughts, etc. When they arise, there is birth, and when they pass away, there is death, moment-to-moment? -moment. Uh, yes, basically, uh, uh, when the six senses, you know, we have contact through the six senses, and that's when the consciousness is born each moment. Uh, so, you know, the dependent on contact arises feeling that that feelings are born from the contact. It's not mentioned, birth isn't mentioned exactly in that process, but that's basically what occurs. Uh, so the, it's the contact that gives rise to the feeling and then the birth of the men, and you be, then you become uh, aware of the five aggregates, feeling, perception, volition, consciousness. Or the, the feeling is because of the material stimulation. Uh, and, you know, without contact, basically, you'd be in an unconscious state, like, or let's say if you're sleeping, now all of a sudden there's a big 
bang, and then you wake up because of contact, then you're aware of your body again, you know, and then your senses are working again. But when you're sleeping, except for the unconscious mind, you're, you're not really aware too much of the body or the external world. Uh, <clears throat> but there, there, of course, there are subtle contexts going on, but I'm talking about in the general sense of the normal types of sleep. Uh, and then the, when you wake up, the, then you're born again kind of like and everything starts working again. Next, Bobby asks, do each of the six consciousness get reborn into different beings? Uh, <laughs> well, this idea of six consciousness is, is kind of misleading because it's just consciousness acting through any one of the six senses. And each one of those arises and vanishes. So it's not like a particular sense consciousness gets uh, transmitted into uh, another being or, you know, it's the relinking consciousness and it's difficult really to describe exactly what that is. And energy transference is what was mentioned earlier. So it could be a, you know, an idea about it, but it's not the particular one of the six sense conscious. These are not different consciousnesses. They're just the way that consciousness is arising through one of these avenues, one of these uh, avenues, like a car, you come to an interchange, you could take six different exits, right? And, you know, and so the consciousness is either one at a time can only come about. So, you know, when you're hearing, then you're not uh, seeing at the same time or smelling and tasting and touching, but these things, arise so fast, we don't see the changes and it appears like they're happening at the same time, but in the deepest level, they're not. Next, uh, Eva asks, why do some people experience meditation sickness after meditating? Some people experience restlessness who eat some stage or others, their physical body changes such as autoimmune or hypersensitivity. Uh, meditation sickness after meditation. Well, that's the first time I've heard of meditation sickness in terms of uh, uh, physical sensations. Uh, one kind of meditation sickness is you become so attached to tranquility and you lose a touch with the reality uh, and uh, you know it could cause the, the mind to become mentally uh, deranged a little bit if you get if you develop too much concentration and not enough wisdom, the mind can become unbalanced. But I suppose other things can happen, uh, you know, uh, meditation sickness, uh, uh, you know, can cause, uh, could cause some physical symptoms too. Uh, but uh, I, you know, don't have much to, to say about that uh, specifically uh, about this. Uh, meditation sickness. Although, you know, everything affects our mind in one way or another and people's bodies are, are different. And, uh, and things changing our consciousness and the vibration of our consciousness and, and the way we think and react naturally, it's gonna have effects on everything within our body-mind system. But a lot of times there would be positive effects, but who knows, you know, it could be negative effects too. Okay, and the last question for the session, Bobby says, probably due to my depression, I was led to the clear realization of non-self independent origination, but it wasn't through meditation. It was more through contemplation. Does it matter how I realized this? Well, it depends on what this clear realization of non-self means because it can mean different things to different people and a person could be deluded. They, they might think that they've experienced really non-self, but there, there's so many different subtle layers and degrees of that where I would hesitate to say one way or another whether it was that realization of no self would be the same as let's say somebody who developed uh, this uh, the sotapati, you know, you know, attain any one of these uh, stages of uh, entering the stream and, and up to the arhat stage and the nibbana datu. So 
I'd be careful when we, you know, claim to have realized uh, some state of no self or so on uh, uh, about, because there's so many different levels of it. We can clearly see people have become, you know, deluded in thinking they were enlightened. There's so many examples that happened in the last, you know, couple of decades with even meditation masters claiming to be enlightened and then they got, you know, caught up into all kind of things and other people too. Okay, well, thank you, Bhante. That's the end of the questions. Uh, so we're coming to the end of our session for the evening. So thank you so much, Bhante Rahula, for sharing the Dhamma with us. Uh, and, great. It helps anybody to perhaps, uh, you know, get some new little insights uh, about the, the process, then, uh, then, you know, so be it. Okay. Uh, uh, and... Yeah. Don't forget, uh, mindfulness a day keeps dukkha away. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, so anyone who wants to learn more from Bhante Rahula, you can follow his channel. He does regular live streams as well. Um, and you can also go to visit his meditation center in Maryland. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, in Maryland. It's near in Gaithersburg. But if they want to, uh, our YouTube channel is accessed through our website. Mm. So it's called the Lion of Wisdom YouTube channel, right? Lionwisdom.org mm. or Lion of, Wis Lion of Wisdom Meditation Center YouTube channel. Mm. Uh, one of those ways <laughs> would get you. But, you know, if you go to our website, which is lionwisdom.org, then we, it'll say videos up at the top bar and you click onto that. And then you'll say YouTube channel, you click onto that, and then you can see all of the talks. Okay. And it's also possible to do retreats at his meditation center. So you can also contact uh, his center for more information on that. Yeah, we are having uh, some uh, uh, in-house uh, retreats. So Thanksgiving retreat now is kind of full. Uh, Christmas retreat. Uh, we're going to have a five-day Christmas retreat at the end of the year. Actually, not Christmas. It's year-end retreat from December 26th to January 1st. Mm. Uh, and then I haven't planned any beyond that, but uh, little by little. Uh, uh, and also here at Empty Cloud Monastery, we're going to have a small uh, five-day retreat here next week. Um, so there's still some space for that. If you're interested, you can contact us for more information. Um, otherwise, please keep joining in with our regular live stream programs. Uh, and we'll end the evening with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.